All right. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you again. Good to be back at this conference. Um, apologize that there's not as much continuity in the design work of this slideshow as there could be, but I was putting it together on a plane last night coming back from Portland. I know there's a lot of folks from out of state, uh, so I, I like to throw up this slide so you know who we are. We're, we're a department uh, or an agency within the Department of Natural Resources uh, for the state of Colorado. Uh, in our mission statement, I like to throw that up as well. So you guys uh, can get an idea of what we do. And the key words there are conserve, develop, protect, and manage Colorado's water for present and future generations. Uh, and then down below there, I've got non consumptive and consumptive water use. Uh, throughout this presentation, we're going to be talking about water use, uh, a lot of things, our objectives at CWCB uh, in the realm of watershed health have to do with protecting water use or water supply. So when CWCB talks about those terms, we're talking about traditional water uses, agricultural, municipal, industrial, but we're also talking about the non consumptive environmental and recreational uses of water as well. Uh, Colorado's water plan, how many people in the room are aware that we now have on the Colorado's first ever water plan? Yes, delivered to the governor in December 2015. Uh, this was a unique process uh, in that a lot of folks at the CWCE actually wrote the plan. We didn't hire the South consultants, we wrote it ourselves. I wrote a chapter um, my boss Kevin was involved in, in a lot of it as well. Uh, and we had over 30,000 comments to the plan uh, that were incorporated in one way or another. Uh, so there was a lot of participation by the citizens of the state as well. Uh, the values of the plan. Now, this was in the executive order, uh, Governor Bickelover's order. Uh, and I think it, it really speaks to the different types of water uses that we have in Colorado and how those values. Uh, have changed or evolved over time. Um, so we're talking about the watershed health, a lot of what people tend to think about there is our environmental use of water and our uh, recreational use of water, but, but watershed health goes much further than just those uses and it also protects our consumptive uses of water as well. For you guys on this side of the room, I'm sorry, I don't have a monitor up here, so I'm kind of focusing on on the screen, but not trying to ignore you over there. Um, so how will we get there? How will we implement Colorado's water plan? Uh, well, there's different areas. Uh, we know we need more storage. Uh, we know that we need to use agricultural water. Uh, and the preference would be setting up a way to share that uh, instead of just the outright transfer from ag to municipal. Uh, we have to improve the great stream reaches uh, and focus on watershed health initiatives. Uh, and then, of course, conservation is a critical component as well. So we have a supply demand gap, uh, and we have objectives on how to meet all these different areas. And so uh, you can see on the slides here a measurable objective uh, to, to achieve this gap uh, by 2030. Uh, now, some of us at the agency are going to still be there in 2030. I really like my job, so there's a good chance I will still be there. So some of these objectives are a little scary uh, when you're reading about uh, them being delivered by 2030. Uh, we've got uh, objectives in conservation uh, to achieve by 2050, uh, and then objectives in land use. 75% uh, of Colorado's will live in communities that have incorporated our saving action. Um, by 2025. Um, agriculture uh, continues to be an important objective in the water plan, uh, and we want to maintain agriculture as a viable uh, source of our economy in the state of Colorado. Uh, storage is incredibly important. We have to look for new opportunities uh, to improve existing storage and develop new storage. And finally, which is my piece. Uh, watershed health. Uh, and this this was a little daunting when I saw this. I wrote the watershed health sections, chapter 7.1. Um, I saw this measurable objective. It, it, it came out from some other staff, and they're like, can, can you get that done? Uh, possibly. Uh, we're going to work hard on it. Uh, the measurable objective is to get 8% of locally prioritized rivers and streams, industry management planning, uh, and to get 80% of critical watersheds 
into watershed plan. Uh, so second one, well on our way. First one, we're going to talk about that a uh, little bit more as we get into this election. Uh, so here's our existing watershed plans. Uh, it just so happens that most of the watershed groups, coalitions of folks in the state are organized around uh, the USGS Hydrologic Unit Code 8, or HUG 8. So that's uh, about the size of a watershed that we do watershed planning in. Just see, for reference, that would be like a Roaring Ford Basin, or the Big Thompson, or Cashel Pooter is a update as well. So we've got some kind of watershed planning uh, in over half of our update basin. So that's a, that's a really good start. Now, approaching the topic of watershed health, uh, I think it's helpful to throw up the definition of what a watershed is. We all have different ideas of that. I think John Wesley Powell has a very good definition of it. Because uh, there's two elements to watershed health. Uh, there's a scientific element, and there's a social element as well. Uh, you can't achieve watershed health without looking at both. Um, right in this section of the Colorado Plan of Water Plan was very interesting to me because watershed health was a term that I, I thought was so vague. I was like, well, anybody can use that phrase, and it doesn't mean anything. There's no real science behind it. Uh, so it was a unique opportunity to actually look at what is the science of watershed health. So in the plan, uh, what we did is we said that the broadly defined watershed health is going to be a measure of ecosystem structure and function. Uh, and then I had to send that out to some PhDs up here at CSU to make sure I didn't screw anything up, because I'm a geomorphologist, not an ecologist. Uh, but structure focuses on your species richness, uh, your inorganic and organic resources, and physical attributes like, like habitat complexity. Uh, and function, a little bit closer to the stuff that I know, uh, a, big, a big ecosystem process in the realm of function is the hydrologic cycle, uh, and flow regime is an important part of that. Of course, the social piece, many of you guys have heard me talk before, have seen the slides, I won't belabor it too much, but the social piece is important as well. We go back to this example of the Blue River watershed, uh, which is an update watershed. Uh, what, what's not in there are the political boundaries. Right? There's city boundaries in there, there's county boundaries in there, there's irrigation district boundaries in there, uh, and other things. So how do you transcend those political boundaries when you're approaching something like watershed up? Well, you've got to come up with some kind of stakeholder group and a collaborative process to start developing a plan that then prioritizes actual items. I'm going to throw Lane's balance up here real quick as we get into a discussion of what resiliency is at the watershed scale. Uh, but this is at the stream scale, uh, and streams that are stable, uh, for lack of a better phrase, tend to exist in what's called dynamic equilibrium, and that's the relationship between water and sediment. Uh, and so in some cases, what we could see in maybe the post-fire environment is a lot more sediment coming into our stream system. Uh, and that can cause aggregation, and that can decrease slopes in streams. Uh, and that can affect our water uses, uh, certainly our recreational uses, our environmental uses has a big impact on habitat, but also our ability to divert water. Is the water quality good enough to divert? We saw problems with that after, after fires uh, in this area, and also is our infrastructure still in place, or is it buried in sediment? We physically can't get the water out of the skin. So, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about flow regime, and I think a lot of you guys are probably familiar with the 100 graph for, for a snowmelt driven system, and that's what we're looking at here. And there's a lot of variables that come into play the discharge, of course, the, the timing of it, and I have my seasons up there. Um, the duration, uh, the rate of change is incredibly important, uh, and the frequency that you experience different flows. Now, this is all ecosystem function. So, again, it gets us back to watershed health. And when we're talking about water uses, this, uh, the flow regime is incredibly important because we have adapted our, our infrastructure 
based on different flow regimes that we, we get from our watersheds. Um, so this is where we get into resiliency. Um, and my definition of resiliency is, is pretty simple. It's uh, the ability for a watershed, in this case, to experience some kind of disturbance and that has little effect on structure and function in that ecosystem. And it can either have little or no effect, or it can recover quickly from it. Um, so, how do we maintain flow regimes so that we don't change uh, what's going on in our watershed, so that we don't cross what they call a threshold boundary? Uh, we cross the threshold boundary, then we may longer rely on flow regime that, that we're used to seeing. It can change the way things run off. I was just working this past weekend, and I thought this was really interesting in an urban environment, uh, where this restaurant we were at, that grass roof, uh, that then overflowed onto a grass roof where people walk their bikes up, that then overflowed into little, uh, areas on the street that had, that had shrubs and stuff growing, and that gathered storm water too. I was like, that's a unique approach at trying to maintain a set your same flow regime given harmonization. You know, this is just one little thing, um, but I thought it was kind of cool to share with you guys today here. So when we're talking about resiliency, ultimately the water's in the river, uh, and that's what we need to perform for. So if we've got a resilient, healthy watershed, then we start looking at our stream channels. Do we have healthy stream channels? Or are our practices, our land use practices up to our stream channels having a negative effect? Uh, in approach to a lot of stream restoration, CWCB does, uh, including the flood recovery that Clint was talking about earlier, we look at this multi-stage channel uh, to accommodate different flows so that we're thinking about all the different elements of the flow regime. We've got base flow contemplated in here. We have average runoff contemplated in here. We have flood flows contemplated in here. And then if you look below uh, at this other slide here, you can see a singular purpose channel. It was built for one thing. It looked at the hydraulics at a maximum flow, and it designed for that flow. But that does very little for us in those other parts of the hydrograph. We don't have a whole lot here in the way of habitat. Uh, we're not accommodating low flow, and certainly not thinking about sediment transport. Because uh, that happens throughout our range of flows. Okay, now the interesting part. Maybe why states invited me here today. How are we going to pay for this? Um, you know, part of the water plan is that we need to raise funds to make these items that we identified actionable. We have to pay for them. Um, and so the, the Colorado Water Conservation Board has come up with ideas on how the state can support that. Uh, CWC certainly can't do it all, and in the realm of watershed health, we've identified other partners. Water quality control division is a big one. Colorado Parks and Wildlife is also a big one. But this is going to rely on, on getting funds from the locals, uh, local government, as well as private foundations. Now, in the short short term, we have uh, this year in our projects bill five million dollars identified for the Colorado Watershed Restoration Program. Uh, and another million dollars to go towards environmental and recreational uses of water uh, through the Water Supply Reserve Fund, which is part of our roundtable process. So just to give you a quick overview, uh, the Colorado Watershed Restoration Program has different grant programs embedded in it. Uh, I administrate these programs. And the big one, uh, the Watershed Restoration Program, grants are typically due in October and November. Uh, we just got through a grant cycle on this. There's different types of grants in that program, but there's overlap with all of these. For example, watershed and stream restoration can have similar objectives as flood mitigation. Uh, the big one is stream management plan grants, which back a few slides, we're going to have 80% of all locally prioritized streams in a stream management plan by 2030. Uh, so this is a new grant type. Uh, in the program, and it's it's grounded in biology, hydrology, and channel morphology, uh, coupled with management strategy. So there's a lot of elements of traditional watershed planning in that you need to do some kind of assessment of your biology, your hydrology, and your geomorphology 
to know what your conditions are in your watershed, but then add to it some kind of management objective and flow means to support an objective. So your objective may be cut or trout habitat, and what are the flow means to support that? Or it could be riparian conditions, and what are the flow means to support that? Um, just quickly and anecdotally, tree management planning is going to be a challenge for the state of Colorado, and it's going to be something very interesting. But I was talking to someone who was working on the leases out of a reservoir, um, and I won't get into any bases around the state, but they have an obligation to release augmentation water for a downstream state. Uh, and they just thought about the timing of the release of that and did it in such a way that it was supporting habitat in their stream as they're delivering that water down. So that's kind of the low hanging fruit of stream management plan. But I will say the folks that are at that table need to go beyond just your traditional environmental and recreational crowd. Have to have the folks at the table that know how the system works. And if you're not talking to your water commissioner, I don't think you've got a good start on stream management plan. More information on how to find out about these grant types that I just mentioned right here, just go to our website, most grants page, uh, and each one has its own page with particular sign. Um, I'm going to jump through these because I'm running out of time, but last year I updated you on the status of our flood recovery, uh, and this is just a logical progression of how we approach watershed planning in the state of Colorado. After the floods, nine or ten coalitions were formed, each one developed a watershed plan. Uh, then we worked with the NRCS and those local coalitions to say what are the priority projects identified in your plans. And the ones that overlapped with the objectives of the NRCS Emergency Watershed Protection Program were able to be enrolled in this project. Lots of different people on the team to help this happen. Uh, it doesn't happen with one discipline alone. You've got to have two more colleges, one of my engineers, ecologists. Uh, security specialists, etc. So we got a pretty big team, uh, and in 26 months to identify the projects, get the match funding, uh, get the landowners to participate, uh, and then do the field work and permitting and do the construction. So just as a reminder, you guys saw the earlier slide with all the different watershed plans in the state. That includes these flood-affected watersheds as well, and that's where we're working uh, very diligently right now. Uh, and we've gotten a lot of things done. We've got a long way to go. I would just like to ask the crowd real quick, how many of you guys have implemented a river restoration project before? Show of hands. How many have implemented a six-figure river restoration project before? How about a seven-figure river restoration project before? Not as many. How about a half dozen? Seven figure river restoration projects in one watershed in a year and a half. Devin, your hand should be up. This is a big challenge. This is the biggest thing the state of Colorado has ever done in the realm of river restoration. Uh, and I've yeah, got some timelines here, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just blast through those. Um, but we've got a, our plan to implement all these projects in these different watersheds. Uh, into 2017, we've got some successes in 2016, uh, and we'll continue to move forward with those. Uh, and then here's here's the real silver lining: the program's there to protect life and property. Uh, but when NRCS approached us to be a partner with them in this, they realized the multiple objectives that could be met and how that benefits watershed health uh, and water uses in the state. Um, we want to enhance the ecological, biological, and geomorphic functions while protecting life and property. Uh, and it's built on this pyramid. How many of you guys have seen this Harmon et al. Uh, pyramid? This is wonderful. I wish I had more time to talk about it. But if you're going to approach river restoration, you've got to look at hydrology. You've got to look at hydraulics, geomorphology, the physiochemical relationships, and, of course, the biology. And that will lead you to success. Uh, and so I'm very passionate about this topic. I'm going to be around all day. I can talk to you guys about it then. Why do I do it? I do it for this guy. Because um, this future generations that we want to make sure that they can appreciate it. Thank you, guys.
Yeah. All right. Uh, first, if you want to stick around for just a minute, uh, we've got five minutes of uh, questions here. Uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand. Uh, I'll let you here at the microphone. We're still going over to you every once in a while. Uh, and then we'll get to the last one. Uh, and then we'll get to the last one. Uh, and then we'll get to the last one. All right. All right. Thank you very much.